Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So um, as I've mentioned before, I've got a Patreon channel and on there I sometimes share information and ask questions of my patrons um, that don't necessarily go out on the public channel. But um, some time ago I asked for some suggestions for upcoming videos and I got a lot of really, really good uh, focused suggestions there. And one of those suggestions came from Matthew. And uh, well, let's see what Matthew asked. Matthew says, I would really like you to discuss the effects of adrenaline in a fight and how that impacts a fight. Modern sources tell us of officers and soldiers pulling off impossible shots and people lifting cars to save loved ones. Could a person under the influence of adrenaline fence better than ever before or cut an opponent in two? Well, you know, the simple kind of sentence answer to that question is yes, uh, with certain caveats. But there's something more interesting to consider than that. Then, yes, adrenaline can, in some cases, enable people to do things above and beyond, go above and beyond the call of duty, and to do things which they themselves often wouldn't have considered that they could have done in normal action, whether it be combat or whether, as the example that Matthew gives, it's saving someone who's trapped under something, um, or running into a burning building, this kind of thing. And I think that there are two main um, things, they're connected of course, but there are two main things we need to break this down into. Overcoming physical adversity and overcoming your mental state or mental adversity, should we say. Okay, so one situation of that is, uh, say for example, you're protecting your child and a, uh, a lion escapes in the zoo and uh, to protect your child, you put yourself between your child and the lion and face it down. Um, this is the kind of situation where adrenaline makes you step up to a situation where normally you'd probably run away or hide or behave differently. Now, um, in physical adversity, what we must say is, so combat is a, is a common example that we would talk about on this channel, um, where you realise that really you've got to pull something out of the bag to stay alive, um, and, uh, or indeed to save someone else. And so you really go above and beyond in what you, how you exert yourself physically. And yet, absolutely, we all know about the, uh, the so-called examples of people lif lifting a car and this kind of stuff. Now, I know if we actually look into those individual examples, we often find that some of those are questionable or indeed that for some reason or another, it wasn't as incredible as it first seems. But nevertheless, there are examples where people have clearly done things physically that it wouldn't have normally been expected of them to be able to do that. Um, so yes, uh, adrenaline can have an effect phys physically on you and mentally on you. But what I want to discuss more than that is um, the fact that it's kind of random. Now, not obviously totally random, but that the effect that the adrenaline has on you is potentially so complex and so reliant on so many little tiny factors that it might seem to be random. So for example, if we take a scenario where we're trying to make rules for a role-playing game or wargaming, for example. Let's use wargaming as an example. So um, we've, got our, we've got our forces, we've got some models on the table, and we've decided to make some rules for how a unit of troops behaves under stress. Now, what's that stress? Well, let's say, this is a fairly typical example from wargaming rules. Let's say they lose 10% of their force in one engagement, like in one immediate thing. So for example, a landmine goes off, or they get hit by some artillery, or they get hit by cavalry. Okay, so 10% of their number, of their fighting force, say they're 100 men um, and 10 men, instantly get wiped out, like that. Okay, what effect psychologically does that have on the remaining 90 men? Well, adrenaline is very clearly a part of this. But each individual of those 90 men will obviously experience their adrenaline in a different way. Some of them might, have, might, might be completely nonplussed by it. Some of them might be absolutely terrified by it. Some of them might be outraged to the point of anger by it. Um, so you might get people who are fearful. You might get people who are aggressive. You might get people who are just completely neutral. Um, and any of these things could happen. But moreover, that doesn't only happen to a given person the same way every time. Depending upon other circumstances, for example, how well they've slept, how well they've eaten, um, what has happened in the preceding um, hour or 10 minutes or 10 seconds, 
um, and indeed what their leadership is like, if they have friends around them, uh, if it's hot, if it's cold. There are so many factors that govern how an individual, not even 90 people, but how an individual will respond to stress, okay? And how they would deal with that adrenaline. And in some cases, absolutely, you might get an overwhelming number of that 90 remaining soldiers who are so outraged by what's just happened that they get a surge of energy and rage and just mow through the enemy and it gives them something positive out of it. It gives them the ability to fight better than perhaps the 100 people would have done before those 10% were destroyed. But very often, and what we would normally simulate in something like wargaming rules, is when 10 people are wiped out instantly like this, what we tend to do is so that there's likely to be a fearful effect, uh, perhaps the, the tendency to rout or run away, or even to retreat slightly from whatever caused that damage. So for example, let's say it's, um, let's say it's a cavalry charge has just ploughed into the side that let's say the flank of this unit of infantry and it's instantly with lances say the lances have come into the infantry and wiped out 10 of that 100 men the remaining 90 men are now faced with a situation where they've instantly seen 10 of their um, of their compatriots die um, or be incapacitated but they're also faced with an ongoing threat so that thing which has just killed those 10 people is still a threat and so therefore those remaining 90 people they might lose unit cohesion they might turn and run away or they might uh, surrender, they might throw down their weapons and surrender. All of these things are possible depending upon the exact circumstances of the war and the period and the type of soldiers, the type of leadership, these many, many complex factors. Additionally, if the thing which killed the 10 men wasn't, say, a cavalry charge with lances, let's say it was a, 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 a shell from a mortar. So a mortar lobbed a shell over and it went boom and killed, let's say, 10 men from the middle of the unit. Now, this is also important where the men are instantly lost from, from the flanks, from the back, from the front, from the middle. Generally speaking, psychologically speaking, the people at the back and towards the middle of a unit will probably expect themselves to be safer against most types of threat, um, at least threat from other humans directly, um, whereas those at the front are probably psychologically more prepared to engage with the enemy and to be uh, under immediate threat, for example, having arrows shot at them or having an enemy pike block come at them. But of course, a mortar doesn't respect that. A mortar could hit a mortar shell could hit any part of the unit indiscriminately. It could be the end, could be the front, could be the back, could be the middle, and could just kill people within an area. And that might have a very diff different type of psychological effect on the men, because of course, first of all, it's random, it's incredibly scary. You realize you're in mortar range, you realize that there's probably gonna be, now that they've found their range, other mortar shells landing on you, potentially, if you're still alive. Um, unless you move, so the urge to move, usually to move further away, sometimes to move closer or to the side, um, is going to be strong. But there isn't an immediate visual threat. So for example, with the cavalry, you come in, you've seen 10 of your friends die or 10 of your partners die, um, and you can see the threat, you can see what the threat is. So in that situation, you might think, Wah! and you might just charge towards them and try and take them out, try and get vengeance. But if you've been hit by an artillery shell, and it's killed 10 of, your, um, 10 of your partners, 10 of your mates, then you can't fight back directly against that mortar shell because it may have been shot from five or a thousand yards away. Um, so your urges might be different in that situation. They might be more, well, I want to get somewhere under cover. I want to move. I want to go somewhere that my commander doesn't want me to go, but I want to get to a safe place. So dependent, and these are just examples. And so if we're gonna, if we were talking about wargaming again, for example, if we were going to make this into rules, how do we decide in rules, in wargaming rules, what happens when 10% of a fighting force, a unit, let's say, a unit of pikemen for, for simplicity's sake, a unit of pikemen, what do we do when 10% of them are lost? Well, I would argue that what wargaming rules should do is encapsulate some of the things I've just spoken about. In other words, what type of loss was it? Was it a loss due to a 
uh, a, a feature in the landscape, some lava, a big hole, I don't know, uh, or was it due to enemy action? And if it was due to enemy action, was it due to, for example, something that they can't fight back against immediately, for example, an artillery shell, or was it due to an enemy unit of pikemen or an enemy unit of cavalry? Um, was it due to a gaseous cloud, mustard gas, um, uh, you know, World War I scenario? There are all sorts of reasons. So, Coming back to Matthew's original point, adrenaline absolutely can make you perform above and beyond what you would normally be able to do. But adrenaline breaks down into so many different categories. For example, if I'm attacked, okay, if I'm attacked in my, in my uh, class where I run classes every week and I happen to be teaching martial arts and someone decides to attack me, psychologically I'm probably going to be better prepared for that there than if someone attacked me and I was in the process of waking up and thinking about having breakfast at home. So I'm the same person, but it's a completely different scenario. And equally, the type of attacker, if I was attacked by a dog in the street, um, it would be a different type of impulse I would get and different urges I would get than if I was attacked by a burglar in my house wielding a kitchen knife. Okay, different types of different types of things. Now, funnily enough, despite the fact that the the timing and the place is very different between those two things, probably my reaction in both of those situations, I hope, is going to be approximately similar and appropriate to dealing with a potentially fatal or lethal threat. Um, but clearly, in some situations, your best chance of survival is running away. In other situations, your best chance of survival is hiding. In some situations, your best chance of survival is fighting. And in other situations, it might be more complex. It might be gather people together and fight. Or um, it might be that you're protecting someone, so you're fighting, and that might not ensure your best chance of survival, but it might ensure their best chance of survival. Or, even more complex, it might be to fight, but to bide time. For example, if you know that the police are coming, you might purely be fighting to stay alive, but not necessarily to take the opponent out, because if you can stay alive, you know that help is that the cavalry is on the way. So, in other words, it's an incredibly simple question with an incredibly complex answer. And I like to often think about these things in terms of, that's why I used wargaming rules. If you think about role-playing rules or wargaming rules, how would you make this mathematical? How would you write a formula? And the point is, it's so complex, I kind of wouldn't know where to begin. I think you could go so complicated, you could make it so accurate that it would be so complicated you could never use it in any type of wargaming or role-playing rules. Um, but if you wanted to keep it a little bit simpler, maybe break um, this adrenaline or stress or fear factor down into maybe five different types. So for example, when your unit of 100 pikemen loses 10 men in one turn, then uh, they have to take a role to whether they run away or whether they um, sh move back a bit or whether they uh, surge forward or, you know, these t different types of things dependent upon these five different categories. For example, artillery shell, uh, enemy infantry, enemy cavalry, geographical feature like falling off a wall or a cliff or something, these types of things. And I think those that would be the closest we could get to it in practical terms, analysing how a group of people might react to stress or sudden adrenaline dumps. How individuals re respond to it is so complex and so based on so many tiny factors, everything to do with, you know, like how much sleep they've had and everything like that I mentioned before. It's very, very complex and very difficult to uh, predict. And so someone who might win the Victoria, Victoria Cross or, you know, the Medal of Honour or whatever today, if exactly the same thing happened to them the day before, they might not have done that thing in the same way. They might not have won that medal. Not to undermine heroes. They're still heroes because they did do that thing. But just to say that not everybody will behave exactly the same way every single time. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. We've got extra videos on Patreon, T-shirts on Spreadshirt, and I hope to see you for the next video.